welcome back, friends. So, you know, first thing, Sarah and I, disclaim, our first thing is going to be a disclaimer right off the bat. Because Sarah and I do not propose to offer an exhaustive study on the dark night of the soul. Rather, we just want to offer some insights and thoughts so that when the valley of tears comes, and as we know, they do. They come individually and they do come collectively. And what I have in mind is the body of Christ, as it always does. We were, I recall Teresa's Avila's attitude here, that the sufferings of the Church of Christ, and thus they would trouble her greatly. So for those of us who love our church, and we see her in this val, this what is a valley of tears, yeah, dark night of the soul, and it troubles us greatly. We mm -hmm. are in very good company. It troubled Teresa Avila as well. So. So here we go. Definition from John Hardin's Modern Catholic Dictionary. He will define a, it's a general term in mystical theology. There are different types of theology, my friend, moral theology, scriptural theology, so forth. And now we're mystical. And it's to identify every form of purification through which God leads persons who is calling to a high degree of sanctity. That's all of us. We're all called to be saints. It is called night to distinguish a person's normal spiritual condition of seeing, although dimly, by the light of faith. Whereas mystical purification, a person, a person, person is deprived of much of this light. There is a groping in the night. It is a dark night to emphasize the intensity of withdrawal of God's illuminating grace. The purpose of such purification is to cleanse the every vestige of self-love and unite a person more closely with God. As the intellect is thus mortified, the will becomes ever more firmly attracted to God and more securely attached to his divine will. Sarah brought this up two episodes ago. This purification, however, is only a means to an end, namely to give greater glory to God who is thereby loved for himself and not for the benefits he confers to, to lead the one that's purified to infused contemplation and even ecstatic union with God and three, to enable the mystic to be used more effectively by God for the spiritual welfare of others. Since the more holy a person is, the more meritorious are that person's prayers and sacrifices for the human race, making reparation for the uh, salvation of others. There is a precise statement that I liked quite well, so it you know, we all like, uh, let's summarize that, Karen. It's the feeling of spiritual emptiness or being abandoned by God is natural in the process of growing closer to Christ. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, I Especially that point where Father Hardin says, and it's it's something that we don't often think about, but that the more virtuous that you become, the more meritorious your offerings to him. Right? You, you, I mean, that to me is just so beautiful that there is, that God can't be outdone in generosity, right? So that if you, if you grow in virtue, then he permits that growth in virtue to, to bear greater fruit, right? There's never a, it's not even really a quid pro quo, right? It's, it's more than that, it's amplified because God will never take away a good thing that he's that he's presented to someone, um, but he certainly can make a, a, a rose bush bloom in winter. Mm -hmm. Oh, he sure can. He sure can. Um, when you said amplify, I just thought of the Magnificat. Yes. I, yeah. I saw magnify magnifies the Lord, yes. right? And as Our Lady, who is of course without spot or blemish. Um, you know, the boast of creation. Right. That's so true for us. 
Mm -hmm. And right. And I don't think we dwell well often um, very much on that aspect of a saintly life, but we kind of know it because we, we we have people who come to us or we will go to people we know who seem to have this prayer thing uh, figured out a little bit better or they live a little bit better and we'll ask them for prayers. Right. So we, we know it in some, in some sort of a fuzzy sense at times. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I, I do think that in general, um, part of the problem, you know, is that, like you said before, that sin will make you stupid, right? It, it literally does cloud the intellect. So your ability, when you are in a state of objective mortal sin, and none of us have a right to say that anyone is subjectively in mortal sin, right? But objectively speaking, when you look at the things that are out there that are wrong morally, and you find yourself in those weeds, well, you're in the weeds, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're not out on the prairie. You're, you're, you know, I, I love the image that Dante presents of that terrifying forest where he runs into the three animals, right? The, the wolf, the she-wolf, the leopard, and the, of course, the other one's escaping me right now, but those three animals, right, that are, that are really, that they, they're driving him to feel terror and an absolute uncertainty of where to go because that is what sin does. And so consequently in this modern world then, because unfortunately so many people are objectively in a state of sin, we're seeking truth wherever we can find it. And that leads us to a lot of gurus, right? A lot of, a lot of panderers to our whims. We want to be confirmed in the weeds as opposed to being removed from them. Right, because we just can't see a way out. So we can just find somebody who will tell us, oh, no, 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 you're supposed to stay in the weeds, right? So we, I think that there's a, an element within the human person that desires to know truth, but when, you are, when your intellect is clouded by sin and the, the intellect of jargon, this is very different from God permitting a person in the state of grace to have their, their intellect clouded for the sake of, of increasing the will, right? I mean, there's a difference that's going on here. There are two different things. When you're clouded due to, due to sin, you're going to reach out to the person who feeds the appetite. But when God puts a person who is intellectually in the dark night of the soul, right, where it's not the body that's in agony, where it's really the soul, it's, it's such a, a, a graced moment for them to grow more toward him, right? It, it's, it seems wrong, right? It seems backwards that when you're in this darkness that you would be able to find God better. But he puts us in darkness specifically because God is not his gifts. God is something beyond that. And so we have to be able to connect with him in a way that is removed from all sensory benefits that he gives us so that we can come to know him and love him and trust him. But that's, those, are, those are means to knowing him. They're not truly knowing him. And so when he is generous to that soul and removes those means, then you enter into communion with the authentic person of God because you will it not because of what we can do for you, but simply because he's good. And it's so different on the other side, like that darkness doesn't will to know goodness. It longs, it wills to be confirmed in, in I don't know, I, want, I don't want to call it, well, in sin, right? It longs to be confirmed in sin. Very true, very true. So let us take up something that also, we're going to take up the topic of depression. Briefly, but I think in a, in a hope in a helpful way. Till the next episode, my friends. Fides, the Graccio.